Today, we're going to talk about why Mars. Why did all these people decide, let's go to Mars? There's a lot of different options out there. There's other planets, there's other moons, there's asteroids, but there's so many of these options. Why did we choose Mars? Let's talk about that. So to start off, let's talk about what the other options are instead of Mars. So there are eight planets. There's Mercury, Venus, Earth, but we don't have to go and explore Earth because we already have Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Those are the eight different ones that we can go out and explore, but why did we choose Mars? Let's think about that for a minute. The first thing that we could talk about when discussing eligibility for exploration is whether or not we can actually walk around there. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the four outermost planets, all have something very odd in common. They're what we call gas giants. So unlike here where we could stand on Earth or if we went to the Moon or Mars, we could just stand on this hard surface, these planets actually don't have a surface. It's thought that they just continue down going from hydrogen gas all the way down to the middle where they get more and more dense and more and more hotter and hotter, similar to our core, but they don't have a surface like ours do. However, there's something interesting about most of these planets. These planets have relatively larger moons. For example, example Jupiter, has four moons that are big enough that we could potentially explore, called Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Saturn also has a few more, Titan and Enceladus. And lastly, Neptune has a moon, Triton, that could also be potentially something that we could explore. So when we look at the gas giants themselves, it's not something that we can actually explore, but when you look about what orbits them, it's something that could be a possibility. Now, why haven't we talked about those as much? Why aren't NASA and SpaceX interested in those? So the biggest problem with the outermost planets, that being Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and all four of these and all of their moons, is just because of how far and how much energy it takes to get there. Just to get to Jupiter, which is the closest one to us, will take 2.73 years to get there. That being said, that's only just to get there, not including the mission on Jupiter or one of the moons, and getting back. So that would at least be a five-year mission. Then we can look at Saturn. It would take six years just to get to Saturn. Again, we have this problem. If we want to go to a moon around Saturn, it's going to take six years just to get there, six years to get back, not including the mission time. And then lastly, Neptune, it'll take 30 years to get there. Now, this is the most efficient way that we're talking about right now. There are other methods where we could do slingshots around other planets, which would make it a little bit quicker, but still it's nothing compared to just going to some of the terrestrial closer planets. Now when we talk about the terrestrial planets, let's talk about how long it takes to get there. So we have three other terrestrial planets other than Earth. We have Mercury, Venus, and Mars. All three of these take less than a year to travel to. Mercury being the fastest, only taking three to four months to get there, and then stay a little while and then come back. That sounds pretty nice, only three to four months. Then we talk about Venus. This is a little bit longer, being closer to five months to get there. So still not as nice as Mercury, but much better than the gas giants. And then lastly, we have the one that we talk about the most, Mars. Mars takes eight to nine months to get there. And typically going to Mars, you don't need a gravitational slingshot since it's relatively close. So even though it's the one we all talk about, it will take eight to nine months to get there using the most efficient method. So then let's talk about why not Mercury, right? It's the one that takes the least amount of time to get there. But let's talk a, lot, a little more about what Mercury is like. So Mercury is the smallest of the eight planets and is the closest one to the sun. Now because since it's so close to the sun, there really isn't an atmosphere around Mercury. Actually, it's thought to not really have an atmosphere at all. Since it's so close, the solar winds that the sun produce actually tosses all the gases in the atmosphere back out. So anything that Mercury's slow, small gravity can hold usually just gets bombarded by solar activity. Now, this is a major problem for Mercury because since it's so close to the sun and since it doesn't have an atmosphere, it can't hold a temperature. So on the sunny side of the on the sunny side of Mercury, it usually stays around 800 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really really hot. And then on the night side of, this, of Mercury, it gets down to negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a major problem 
because if you wanted to go settle colonization, half the time you need to be able to sustain really, really hot temperatures, and the other half the time you'd have to make it so that it would be able to sustain really, really cold temperatures. So you'd have to basically be doing the impossible by creating both. And that is the main reason why mercury is not an option for current exploration. So now that Mercury is no longer an option, that leaves Venus. Now, Venus is actually really interesting because when it was first discovered by astronomers hundreds of years ago, it was thought to be potentially a sister of Earth. It was actually called a sister of Earth because people thought it could have been a tropical paradise, something very similar. And that is because it shined in the night sky, it's the second brightest object in the night sky, and it's almost the same size of Earth. It's only 20% lighter and with its atmosphere, it's about the same radius. Now, to talk a little bit more about Venus, the atmosphere is the major difference. Why aren't we going to Venus, you may ask? Well, it's because its atmosphere is 90 times that of Earth's. Meaning, let's relate that pressure-wise, that's like if you went 3,000 feet underneath sea level, under the water, and got to experience that. That would be as if you took a styrofoam cup like this, and shrunk it down to about the part you see next to it. That's a major difference and a really high pressure. And because of that pressure, it actually rains sulfuric acid near the surface, which is extremely corrosive and would melt or would corrode through a lot of materials that we would make here on Earth. Now, to continue, since it's a huge atmosphere, it also holds in a lot of sunlight. It makes it really warm which makes it around 850 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface night and day. This is an extreme what's called greenhouse effect, like a greenhouse that holds in hot air or holds in sunlight. It does the same thing, but it's super thick atmosphere. Like I said, 90 times bigger than Earth, hold it in so much that it's actually hotter than Mercury, even though it's further from the sun. Now, because of that, since it's so hot, and it's so corrosive near the surface, Venus is not currently on our list of exploration. Now that doesn't mean in the future we could have a floating civilization on Venus, but for now, if we want to land on the surface, Mars is probably our best option. So now that we've gone over all the other planets other than Mars and talked about why they aren't the main focus right now, we only have one last thing to talk about, and that is our very own moon. Now. Most people look at the moon, and when you talk about space exploration, you think of Neil Armstrong, 1969, being the first man to set foot on the moon. Well, that's a great feeling. And to be honest, the moon is actually a much easier and simpler task than going to Mars. That's why we were able to do it so long ago. Now, I don't want to say it was easy, but it does only take about 33 to 35 percent of the amount of energy to go from the Earth to the moon, rather than to go from Earth to Mars. And even then, the trips, to the trips to go explore the moon were maybe a week, maybe a little bit longer, whereas trips to go visit Mars are planned to be at least a year, probably closer to two or three years. And just having a capsule in space for two to three years or a couple astronauts live in space for two to three years is something that's never been done before. So the moon is actually looking as a great candidate for developing civilization. Now, there are still some problems to putting a civilization on the moon. And that is, one, it's very similar to Mercury in that it doesn't have an atmosphere, meaning the day and night side of the moon actually fluctuate in temperature a lot. It goes from negative 298 degrees Fahrenheit to positive 224 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, as you may know, the orbital day on the moon is about every 28 to 30 days, It'll, similar, that's why we have a month. But that orbital day of the moon means that for 15 days straight you'll be in sunlight and then for 15 days you'll be in the cold. So you have to develop solar panels that will be able to survive on that. And what we learned from the Apollo days is that the moon is actually mostly made up of similar materials and elements that are here on Earth. A lot of what is made from the moon is because of the formation of the moon a long time ago, which is the same materials that came from the Earth. So going and exploring Mars would be a much more scientific, would, would host much, many more scientific discoveries rather than just developing a civilization on the moon. The main difference though would be if we were to develop something on the moon, it would be much easier 
and a lot more of a learning curve for us rather than trying to do something brand new in a completely different place that we've never been before. So since we have knocked everything off the list, we've talked about the moon, we've talked about many other moons around gas giants, and we've talked about the other tertiary planets, that leaves us with the one and only Mars. Now, Mars is actually pretty good when you look at these other planets. As mentioned in the last video, you know that the fluctuation in temperature is still pretty large going in the negative 100 to maybe even negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit in the cold, but upwards of 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the warm. Now, even though that still sounds pretty crazy, it's much better than the 850 degrees temperatures that you see on Venus or the major fluctuations that you see on Mercury. Now, it's still not going to be easy. There are many more problems that have to come up, but Mars is currently the best candidate just because it's one of the closest options, just a little bit more energy than it takes to get from Earth to Mars than Earth to Venus, and it has the most stable temperatures and it's also at a good location where solar panels still work. Because if we had to go any farther or if we wanted to go explore some moons on Jupiter, we would actually not be able to use solar panels because it would be too far away from the sun. So overall, Mars is the best candidate for all this space talk just because its temperatures are kind of stable and it's something that people have been looking for, scientific discovery, for a while now. With that, that is all I have to say for this episode. Next time we're going to talk more about the history of Mars and what makes it so special. Thanks.